Alright, welcome back. In this video, we will cover our last chapter in our Anatomy and Physiology for Health Professionals course. Uh, the journey's end. Now what? Alright, a quick introduction. Uh, the basics you have learned throughout this course will act as a foundation for things that you encounter in life. Uh, this chapter will look at a small example of how A and P plays an important role in many areas. See learning outcomes for this chapter? Uh, discuss the relationship between forensic science and anatomy and physiology. Relate anatomy and physiology changes to the process of aging. Uh, discuss the concept of wellness and personal choices. List and describe wellness, wellness concepts for each body system. Uh, discuss cancer prevention and treatment. And lastly, uh, dazzle your friends with amazing anatomy and physiology facts. Now first, we'll start off with uh, forensic science. Now, much of what you see on TV in crime dramas is pretty close to real, if not dead on, to the actual things that are done to solve crimes. Although it is often really tedious and takes a lot more time to accomplish in real life. Now, forensic science is the application of science to law. All right, a forensic scientist often searches for and examines physical traces to establish or exclude someone uh, being suspected of uh, committing a crime. Both physical science, like A and P, and social sciences are used by a forensic scientist. There's the, the stereotypical chalk outline drawing of a dead body, even though this is never ever used in real life. It does you know, look cool on TV. I first talk about disease detection. Uh, forensic science has helped us learn something about the health of ancient people, such as the fact that ancient Egyptians uh, were also stricken with uh, TB. And we think of TB as a lung disease, but it can affect any area of the body with a high oxygen content, like the brain or the kidneys or the ends of long bones. And this fact was discovered by examining the ends of long bones of the skeletal remains of ancient Egyptians. Now, forensic scientists have discovered the evidence of primitive surgery in ancient cultures also. A 400-year-old skull fragment from the Jamestown, uh, Virginia settlement provided evidence of skull surgery, most likely an attempt to drill a hole in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain due to a skull fracture. Uh, the patient was a European male with traces of lead absorbed from using a lead-glazed pottery and or eating off of uh, pewter plates. All right, remains identification? Uh, the analysis of a dead body can reveal a great deal about that person. Video skull face uh, superimposition allows experts to mark a skull uh, with pins at 30 different specific structural landmarks and compare those 30 points to a picture of that person when they were alive. Uh, dental records can also be compared to the set of teeth uh, if found in the skull. All right, now we'll talk about uh, applied science, uh, if bones could speak. See, skeletal remains can also assist in telling the sex of the individual. Uh, the female pelvis is shaped uh, like a basin and is much wider than it is in the male, allowing for the developing fetus. Uh, in general, the female pelvis is broader and lighter than the male, and then the pubic angle is 100 degrees or greater. See, the male pelvis is more funnel-shaped and is much heavier and stronger with a pubic angle of 90 degrees or less. Here's a comparison with the male and female pelvis. The male pelvis will not be as wide because we do not males do not you know, bear children. So this pubic angle here is 90 degrees or less. Now compare that to the pelvis of a female where it's going to be much wider, 100 degrees or more. So just by knowing a fact just like that, you can tell if, if a person was male or female you know, just based on uh, characteristics of the pelvis alone. All right, now I'll talk about hair forensics. The hair will speak volumes about the person's health and their habits. Hair, whether it's cut or pulled, uh, can reveal the race of an individual. If the hair shaft of the follicle is attached, you can get genetic information such as DNA or a blood type. The hair samples uh, can place the individual at the scene of a crime, for example. And the hair acts as a, a library, storing information about what substances were in, ingested by that person or to which what substances they were exposed to. Now, since hair grows slowly, it can act as a timeline. All right, fingerprints. Uh, no two fingerprints are exactly alike. Even for those of identical twins, they're going to be slightly different. So no one has exactly the same fingerprints that you do. And the fingerprints are actually friction ridges that form a pattern 
on the anterior surface of the hands and on the plantar surfaces of the feet. These are especially prominent on the toes and on the fingers. The fingerprints are made while we're inside the womb developing uh, in response to the pull of the elastic fibers on the dermal papillary layer, papillary layer of the epidermis. And these friction ridges help uh, prevent slippage when grasping or holding objects. And even identical twins have different fingerprints. Fingerprints were discovered in the 1600s and they were first used in 1880 to solve crimes. All right, here's an example of a, of a standard fingerprint. All right, DNA fingerprinting. Uh, DNA, the molecule that makes you you, that was found in the nucleus of every one of our cells, uh, can be used to identify individuals. DNA can be sampled from blood or semen or bones or even a very tiny soft uh, tissue sample. Now during DNA fingerprinting, DNA molecules are split into pieces and they're separated using electrical currents. Then this is compared to a sample from a relative of the victim or from another sample from a victim removed from their teeth or from their hairbrushes or to a suspect's DNA. Now DNA fingerprinting uh, techniques are used extensively to clear up mysteries. For example, it's now standard to use this technology to solve rape and murder cases. The DNA fingerprinting also helped to determine that Thomas Jefferson or a male relative of his did father uh, children with his slave Sally Hemings. It's also used to identify many of the victims from the 9-11 tragedy. See, uh, geriatrics. We are seeing an increase in elderly populations due to uh, safer workplaces, uh, people having healthier lifestyles, the effectiveness of vaccines and medications, and then access to improved health care. Now geriatric patients will differ in many ways when compared to other populations, and it's important to understand these differences. Now the term elderly uh, can be misleading, so let's get a little bit more specific by using a more detailed classification system. Uh, for example, those aged 65 to 75 are considered to be younger old, those 76 to 84 older old, and then over the age of 85 elite old. All right, now we'll talk about aging. We do not age uniformly. Uh, for example, a person who may look old due to the aging of their skin, which causes wrinkles, but may have the cardiovascular system of someone 15 years younger than they actually are. There's a general 1% rule in which we see a decline of 1% in function in most body systems after we reach the age of 30. So the older we get, the less and less efficient our body systems become. All right, talk about some hallmark signs of aging. It's the hallmark sign of aging is a decrease in the ability to maintain homeostasis as we age. Now, older people may have a normal baseline, but will show a decrease in the ability to handle stressors. The disease processes, they may accelerate the loss of body reserves, such as recovery time or complications following an accident or surgery. It may be difficult to evaluate the elderly because of declines in vision, uh, hearing, or possible their, uh, possibly their mental abilities. All right, some general body changes. The total body water declines in both men and women, which will lead to faster dehydration and slower excretion rates of medications. From age uh, 20 to 70, there's a loss of body mass due to as much as 30% loss in numbers of muscle cells and a general decrease in muscle strength. We see an increase in body fat, slowly, slowly increasing from uh, 25 to 45, peaking at age 40, and this may continue to about age 70. Uh, the fat is much uh, deeper, more abdominal, and more uh, found in the viscera than the uh, subcutaneous fat. Uh, bone density. Uh, bone density will usually peak at age 35 in both men and women. Uh, women may experience a 1 to 2 percent loss of bone in the first five years following menopause. Uh, in general, we see a 1 percent decline in bone mass between the ages of 55 and 70. And after age 70, there is a half a percent per year loss. And as individual ages, they generally, they generally will lose muscle mass they'll gain fat and lose bone density. That is normal. Now the rate of change will vary among individuals based on their lifestyle choices. Now there are things that will slow these things down and will be discussed later in this video. All right, first, I'll talk about uh, gustatory changes. Uh, the senses of taste and smell begin to deteriorate as a natural process of aging. Uh, the number of taste buds will decrease by 
50% in the geriatric stage. So sweet versus bitter tastes become less discernible as do salt and uh, bitter. Uh, orange juice may have a uh, metallic taste to it at this age. Uh, the elderly may experience a decreased ability to the taste, making it difficult to ensure a balanced diet. 33% of the elderly uh, will live alone, which makes it difficult for them to perform activities of daily living, or ADLs. And 5 to 15% exhibit protein and caloric malnutrition, because there's no one there to tell them to eat better, or to help prepare a more balanced diet, or more balanced meals. Now, some barriers to good nutrition. Uh, the elderly experience many barriers to good nutrition, including the loss of teeth, having difficulties in swallowing, uh, a decrease in salivary excretions, uh, decreases in digestive juices and secretion, uh, a decrease in bowel function and decreased nutrient absorption. I uh, see uh, the brain and nervous system. Uh, the elderly have an increased reaction time, increasing the likelihood of motor vehicle accidents and falls and burns and other accidents. So it just takes them longer to respond to situations like that. So the slower you are to respond, the more likely it is that you're going to get hurt. See, pain is often a problem in the elderly, leading to an overall decrease in the quality of life, which can include uh, impaired sleep, uh, decreases in social socialization, uh, confusion, depression, malnutrition, uh, impaired ambulation, and polypharmacy. And all of these will lead to an increasing healthcare cost. See, pain management. Geriatric patients are often under-medicated for pain due to patients who are debilitated or cognitively impaired or have a history of substance abuse or are unable to effectively relate how they feel. If they can't tell the doctor how much pain they're in, then they will be given the proper medications to alleviate that pain. Uh, sometimes poor pain management is the result of healthcare professionals who cannot recognize the indicators of pain. All right, pain indicators. Uh, behavioral changes related to pain can include uh, changes in personality, such as becoming more agitated or more quiet or withdrawn or being confused and depressed. Also, a loss of appetite is an indicator of pain. Uh, screaming and swearing, uh, name calling, uh, grunting, uh, noisy breathing, uh, fidgeting or rocking, uh, wincing, uh, rubbing a sore area, uh, cold, clammy, pale skin. All these are good indicators that someone's in pain. Uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, changes in the aging cardiovascular system can include the calcification of the heart valves, which will decrease how effective they work, a lessening of the flexibility of blood vessels, which can lead to clogging of these vessels, the inability to deal with uh, blood pressure changes, resulting in a higher blood pressure, a decrease in cardiac output, and a 25% decrease in the maximum heart rate. The genitourinary system. Uh, between the ages of 20 and 80, we lose about 50% of our renal function. Now, this number is especially significant when we think of the number of medications that, that this age group will use. Reduced metabolism of medications can lead to the accumulation of the drug, which can be harmful or even uh, toxic. So there's, an, it, there's also an increase in incontinence in this age group. The integumentary system, uh, changes in the integumentary system, include the loss of the elasticity of the skin, an increased uh, delicacy of the skin, uh, multiple skin lesions, an increased incidence of skin cancers. And there are some situations that can accelerate these changes, including uh, sun exposure or smoking or medications like uh, corticosteroids. All these can accelerate these changes. Let's see, polypharmacy this is the administration of many drugs all at the same time is a major concern in this age group. The contributing factors include the fact that they see many different specialists for a variety of diseases, but there's no one doctor who oversees everything. So these multiple diseases have competing therapeutic needs with the combinations of drugs uh, potentially causing life-threatening situations. So aging can also affect the rate of drug absorption and distribution and metabolism and also excretion from the body. So this is why it's so important to tell every doctor that you see what drugs you are currently taking. So there's no conflict with a new drug that he may or she he or she may give you. All right, clinical considerations for drug therapy. Uh, review all medications that the patient is taking, including vitamins and supplements, and looking for any kind of possible drug interaction. Uh, testing the liver and kidney functions because they affect the rate of removal of medications. 
uh, when medicating with uh, opioids, dose by age, not by body weight. Analgesics are stronger and last longer in elderly patients, so it's better to start low and then go slow from there. They instruct the elderly to always keep a written list of their medications and their dosages in their wallet and update them when medications change. See wellness. You are currently making important personal choices about the lifestyle that you want to live that will have a profound effect on your future health and lifespan. So eating properly, exercising within reason, whether or not you smoke or not, whether or not you, whether or not you drink alcohol and how much, uh, where you work, where you live, and all these are, are important decisions that impact your overall health and overall wellness. Not only today, but in years down the road. Now, individual accountability and informed choices are key concepts in deciding your lifestyle. Now, peer pressure can be you know, both positive or negative, and also the ability to read and critically analyze what you read. There's a lot of uh, junk science that's out there, and those tend to be more opinion than actual scientific fact. Now, just because it's online doesn't make it true. Just because it's on TV doesn't make it true. Now, being able to hear a product, hear its description, and then critically analyze, is this legitimate or is just just a sales pitch? All right, nervous system wellness. Stress is a natural part of life. We cannot get away from all forms of stress, which is a good and a necessary evil because it is a motivator. It helps you protect yourself. Now, when stress becomes chronic, and then you can't effectively deal with that stress, it can affect some or all of your body's various systems to some degree or another. See, a stress imbalance can cause eating disorders, uh, digestive problems, uh, a decreased immune system response, decreased memory and work capacities, uh, sleep problems, joint and muscle aches, heart problems, and personality changes. And some of these can be very life-threatening. All right, now we'll talk about the whole patient. Now, when assessing a patient, we too often look at the disease by itself instead of the whole picture. It's very easy to get focused on what's making them sick or what their chief complaint is, but you need to be able to take a step back and see, be able to see the entire picture. Now, this includes not only the other body systems, but also the mental and spiritual aspects of that person. Now, mental illness still carries a stigma, unfortunately, but it's no different than any other disease that requires treatment. A skeletal system wellness. Uh, of course, your diet is extremely important to your growth and the protection of your bones. So a diet rich in calcium and vitamins helps to maintain good bone growth and development. Also, weight-bearing exercises are beneficial as well. Whenever you do weight-bearing exercises, not only are you building up muscle and muscle strength, you're also building up bone as well. See, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, can occur due to repetitive motion in the workplace, like uh, working on a keyboard or playing a piano or hammering. And it's caused by damage to the median nerve because the skeletal structure of the wrist is restricted in movement for, experience, for extended amounts of time when the wrist is kept in an upward bent position. Okay, here's the, the median nerve right here. We're zooming on this image here. So as the wrist gets bent, let's say if you're typing on a normal laptop or on a keyboard, if you keep your wrist in that kind of bent at an ankle position for too long, the median nerve will get squeezed, which will cause tingling and irritation of this nerve. See, muscular system wellness. Proper exercise and diet will help to develop and maintain properly functioning muscles. Now, there are many types of muscle training programs out there, and it's important that you find what is best for you and your needs and for the outcome that you're looking for. The muscle enhancement drugs are often dangerous and have some serious side effects. All right, and here we have what's called the activity pyramid. It's a good illustration on how active you should be you know, during a typical week and what you some common examples of what you could be doing. So for example, the one on the very top, things that you should do sparingly, you know, such as sitting still, you know, watching TV, playing computer games. You know, two to three times a week, leisure activities, you know, bowling, golfing, yard work. Also, uh, weight training or strength or stretching or push-ups. You know, do those about two to three times a week. Uh, three to five times a week, aerobic activities, Swimming, long walks, biking, uh, recreational sports, tennis, racquetball, uh, basketball. And this bottom level here of the pyramid 
you should make an effort every day to take extra steps. You know, taking the stairs instead of the elevator. You know, at work or at school. You know, walk or ride a bike instead of riding in a car. There's some times in every day that you can take an effort to make make yourself more active. All right, and take a mentoring system wellness. A proper diet and hydration is important to the functioning of the system. Then we should drink about eight glasses of water daily at a minimum. Uh, caffeinated drinks or alcoholic drinks are diuretics, which will make you become dehydrated. It will lead to a net water loss. And smoking will cause premature aging of the skin. So that's something you definitely want to avoid. Uh, some sun exposure produces vitamin D. You would want to minimize your time that you spend in the sun between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. This is when the sun is the most powerful. To cover up as much skin as possible, I use uh, sunglasses to protect your eyes and a good sunblock to reduce the risk. And some forms of skin, t skin cancer are treatable, but there are others that are lethal. All right, here's an example here of a squamous cell cancer, that lesion right there. All right, cardiovascular system wellness. A heart-healthy diet that's low in saturated fats, that's high in fiber, and high in uh, fruits and vegetables will maintain an optimally optimally healthy cardiovascular system. The proper level of regular exercise will help keep the heart muscle tone for proper functioning. You know, walking 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week, you know, adjusted to specific requirements for each individual, because that may not be applicable for every single person. Uh, activities like smoking or alcohol or other drugs can have an adverse effect on cardiovascular plus other systems as well. All right, this table we have a the effects of alcoholism on various body systems. So it's not just the liver that it affects, it can impact every body system. For example, for the digestive system, it can lead to liver disease or pancreatitis or gastritis or clotting or blood clotting uh, disturbances. For the cardiovascular system, it can lead to a fatty infiltration of the heart, uh, coronary thrombi, which are thrombuses in the coronary vessels, uh, an enlargement of the heart, uh, progressive cardiac failure, for the nervous system, you know, impaired judgment, uh, very poor powers of concentration, uh, delirium, and, and the hepatic coma. So this is another reason why alcoholism should be avoided. All right, respiratory system wellness. Uh, what we breathe in the air around us can also affect our health. Both outdoor and indoor pollution can lead to respiratory problems. Uh, beware of occupational hazards, if you're especially exposed to dust or vapors such as coal miners breathing in coal dust, which will lead to the development of uh, black lung. The lung responds to irritants by narrowing the airways to minimize the exposure, which will lead to breathing difficulty. Uh, smoking is the number one preventable cause of respiratory disease because it leads to damage of the lung tissue and also will lead to chronic conditions such as bronchitis or emphysema or asthma. Now, smoking increases the occurrence of lung infections and colds as well as sinus infections. And 80% of all lung cancers are traced back to smoking. So it's something that you should, if you are a smoker, you should stop. And if you aren't smoking, you know, continue to not ever start. Uh, smoking can affect the heart also, reducing the available oxygen to the heart muscle. And smoking with alcohol consumption increases the occurrence of stomach and mouth cancers also. So there really is no good that can come of smoking. All right, in this image, we have a comparison of a normal airway and the constricted airway. This is how it should look up here. Now, the space here for more air to flow through. And the, the bronchioles and the alveolar sacs here. When you have an asthma attack, this becomes very, very constricted. Not only is the space narrowed, we get excess mucus that's produced. That's why you get the wheezing sound of air trying to be moved back and forth. So you have a much more narrow space to move the air in and out. The gastrointestinal wellness. See, a proper diet is critical for not only growth, but development and general health. So a lack of nutrients leading to malnourishment can adversely affect your health. The vitamin and mineral supplements can be helpful, but it is best if the diet contains all these essential ingredients. Now, fat-soluble vitamins like A and D and E and K can build up in the body, and if taken to excess, can, lead up, can be built up to toxic levels. All right, on this table, we have some common vitamins and their body systems, such as A, B, C, D, E, and K. For example, vitamin A 
They're used for proper night vision, uh, developments of bone and, and teeth. Uh, see, vitamin C aids in the absorption of iron, promotes a better healing of fractures. Uh, vitamin K, which is needed for proper uh, blood clotting. Okay. Right, this image has some effects of undernourishment on all the body systems. And for example, for endocrine system, it will affect the thyroid hormones, uh, testosterone for males, estrogen for females, respiratory. It can affect your vital capacity and the respiratory rate. It can affect the uh, synthesis of bile. It can have very wide-ranging effects. You know, swollen tongue or gingivitis. The constipation, the blood pressure changes, enlarged heart, uh, brittle hair, numbness, uh, drowsiness, or uh, lethargy, or tremors. So being undernourished can have a huge effect on multiple body systems all at the same time. All right, now we'll talk about uh, clinical application, age and activity related diets and nutritional needs. See, at some time in our educational careers, we have seen the old food pyramid. And which told us you know, what portion of our diet should be dairy, what portion should be vegetables, and so on. Now the big problem with that food pyramid is it was meant to fit everyone. But not everyone has you know, the same sex, or the same height, or the same age, or the same activity level. So that leads us to uh, the USDA's newest spin on the old food pyramid. It's called MyPyramid.gov. And it takes in factors like this into consideration, which will help you determine you know, the best diet for you. This will help to you know, balance calories and what foods to increase, what foods to reduce. So you can enjoy the food that you like, but also eat less of them. So you can have less caloric intake. You will avoid oversized portions. Help you increase your uh, intake of fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains. Or switching to a low-fat milk or fat-free milk. So this is more applicable for every individual's needs as opposed to the old food pyramid. Our endocrine system wellness, uh, proper diet and exercise assist the endocrine system also. Uh, performance enhancing drugs like anabolic steroids that are used to increase strength and endurance can have some very serious side effects including kidney damage, uh, liver damage, uh, increased risk of heart disease, irritability, and aggressive behavior. As we get that term roid rage due to this aggressive behavior. Uh, women taking steroids can develop uh, facial hair and deeper voices in addition to other side effects. And some of these effects can be permanent even after the drug is stopped being taken. Uh, sensory system wellness. Of course, proper diet and hearing and sight uh, protective devices and periodic eye and ear exams are needed for sensory system wellness. Wearing hearing protection around loud noises extends the functional life of your ears because damage to the ear is cumulative. Once there is damage to the organ of hearing, you know, inside the cochlea, that damage doesn't ever come back. Once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, protective eyewear should be worn anytime there's any kind of risk of eye injury, including polarized sunglasses, when the glare of the sun may damage your unprotected eye. See the immune system wellness. Again, proper diet and exercise important to the optimal functioning of the system. Uh, the best way to protect yourself and your patients is with the proper hand washing. Uh, for hand washing to be effective, it requires running warm water, not hot, but warm water, uh, soap, and friction lasting at least 20 to 30 seconds. A common way to remember this is instead of remembering you know, a certain time frame, if you were if you were to sing, row, row, row your boat twice, that takes about 20 seconds. So that's a good way to time yourself as opposed to counting you know, from 1 to 20. This is especially helpful for teaching children on how to wash your hands. Uh, the correct way. So you should wash your hands both before and after contacting a patient, uh, before and after lunch, uh, going to the bathroom, uh, entering or leaving a patient's room, or any time that your hands may become soiled. These some standard precautions. Uh, another way to protect yourself from the spread of pathogens is to follow some, some standard precautions. These assume that anyone can be potentially infectious. So you're better off taking more precautions than, than less. Now some of these precautions can, can include uh, wearing gloves whenever you're going to be in contact with bodily secretions. The other guidelines, wearing a gown, wearing a mask, wearing eyewear. It depends on what you're doing with that particular patient. You know, if you're just walking in and talking to them and leaving, washing your hands is fine. You wouldn't need to put on a mask or eyewear or a gown. Right, now this chart has a little more detail on when you should wear 
these various items. Like for example, uh, for eyewear, a splattering is likely. You no, know, if you are doing a, a suctioning procedure, and if splattering is likely, you should definitely wear eyewear. If you're handling soiled waste or linen or other materials, if splattering is likely or there's an ex extensively soiled item, then eyewear should be worn. If you're doing intubation, eyewear should be worn. If you're inserting arterial access or endoscopy, or anytime there's contact with uh, a body fluid where the potential of splattering is even, no matter how remote, if there's a potential for splattering, eyewear should be worn. So a lot of these are just common sense. All right, current immunizations. Keeping your immunizations current is another protective device for your immune system. The immunization schedules are recommended by the CDC and also the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics and the American Academy of uh, Family Physicians. Now, immunizations are not just given during childhood. Uh, the flu vaccine should be received yearly. Uh, tetanus uh, toxoid vaccinations between uh, every five to ten years. And anyone working in the healthcare uh, environment immunize against hepatitis. The immunizations are particularly important for the very, very young and also the very old. Both of those uh, groups are going to be more susceptible to disease. All right, antibiotics. Uh, the proper use of antibiotics is also important to maintaining your immune system wellness. But the overuse of antibiotics can lead to problems. The antibiotics are not effective against viruses and can harm normal bacteria such as those located in the intestines. And the overuse of antibiotics in children can lead to improperly developed immune systems. Now, taking antibiotics improperly or not following the directions on the prescription label can lead to uh, superbugs by allowing a few bacteria to survive then alter their DNA, making them more and more resistant to that particular type of drug. This can lead to outbreaks of drug-resistant infections. All right, now we'll talk about an applied science, antibiotics. Now, the term antibiotic actually means against life and technically includes medications that will inhibit or destroy any microorganism including bacteria or viruses or fungi. However, the word antibiotic in medicine has meant has, has become associated with only antibacterial agents. The uh, reproductive system, uh, smoking mothers tend to have low birth weight infants, also have an increased uh, tendency to have a premature birth, and higher rate of SIDS, sudden, in, sudden infant death syndrome. The secondhand smoke is dangerous at, in the home, leading to slower lung development in children and an increased incidence of bronchitis or asthma or ear infections. See a diet in pregnancy. While you're eating for two when you're pregnant, one of you weighs very little and doesn't require much. So you really aren't eating for two. The baby will eat and drink what you eat and drink. So it's important to provide the pregnant mother with important vitamins and minerals and nutrients for the developing fetus and to maintain the health of the mother. Uh, calcium, in particular, is important because if the diet is lacking in calcium, the fetus will rob calcium from the mother's teeth and bones, thereby uh, decreasing the integrity of her own system. Uh, spina bifida is a congenital condition of the fetus, can be prevented by adequate intake of folic acid or uh, B complex. Alcohol must be avoided in pregnancy due to the effect on the fetus's nervous system. So one of the last things that you ever want to do while you're pregnant is either smoke or drink. All right, sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. These are a growing problem and can have serious effects on the reproductive system and have lethal effects on the body. Uh, there are various diseases and organisms that can be transmitted through unprotected sex, including oral sex. Now, while condoms are not a foolproof, they are the best means of reducing the risk of transmitting STDs. And the only foolproof method to prevent their spread is abstinence. All right, this table we have some common uh, STDs, uh, the disease and the organism and the symptoms, such as herpes and gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, syphilis and genital warts. How, or what the symptoms are, both for male and female. All right, cancer prevention and treatment. All body systems can be ravaged by cancer, and cancer is the uh, runaway production of and the spread of abnormal cells and is a very complicated disorder. Now, each type of cancer is named for the type of cell that is running amok and has its own unique characteristics. And medical science continues to learn more about cancer every year and develop uh, more effective treatments. However, 
the best predictor of an outcome of a cancer is early detection. All right, so cancer triggers. Uh, any number of triggers can make a cell cancerous, uh, including uh, genes or radiation, uh, sunlight exposure, smoking, uh, fatty foods, viruses, chemical exposures. Now some, like genes and viruses, can't be avoided. But others can be reduced by making changes in your lifestyle. The melanoma risk is the greatest for those living closest to the equator. And melanoma can be prevented by decreasing your exposures decreasing your exposure to UV light. And many types of cancers can be prevented or managed with a healthy diet and exercise. Alright, in this image we have the uh, possible causes and some warning signs of cancer. And there's a well-known acronym that's used by the American Cancer Society. It's called CAUTION. And the first letter of each of these symptoms spells out that term CAUTION. So for example, uh, C, you know, change in bowel or bladder habits. Uh, a, a sore that doesn't heal. Uh, unusual bleeding, uh, thickening, or a lump in breast or elsewhere, indigestion or difficulty in swallowing, uh, obvious change in wart or mole, and a nagging cough or hoarseness. These are some some key indicators of possible cancer. All right, now we'll talk about some amazing facts when it comes to anatomy. Uh, senior citizens are more prone to food poisoning because the this decreased senses of smell and taste and reduced acidity in the digestive juices. Uh, nerve impulses can travel up to 426 feet per second. Yeah. Approximately 480,000 people die each year due to smoking related diseases. It's the equivalent of a jumbo jet full of people crashing every day without any survivors. Right, on average, a healthy kidney will filter 180 quarts of fluid every day, four inches long, two inches wide, and one inch thick. Your hair grows about a quarter inch per month. It actually grows a little bit faster during the day and during the summer months. You use about a half a pint of oxygen uh, per minute while you're at rest. Everyone has one uh, nair larger than the other, so one uh, nostril is a little bit larger than the other. Your heart will beat over 36 million times each year. Uh, you possess over 16,000 miles of capillaries. So you have from 10,000 to 150,000 hairs just on your head alone. Each strand can, of hair can uh, support approximately 100 grams of weight. So at least in theory, a full head of hair could support the weight of two African elephants. The vitamins, uh, natural or in pill form, uh, which one of those is best? Research shows that vitamins and minerals from natural food sources are much better utilized than synthetic pills. But the pills are better than nothing if your diet can't provide what is needed. Uh, the horns of a bull are composed of the same material that makes up your finger and toenails. You have about a quarter of a million sweat glands just on your feet. Right, based on uh, some current research of fibroblasts uh, and their doubling ability, before they can no longer accurately divide, we have the potential to live to 120 years of age. So your eyes can see approximately 7 million shades of different colors. Due to its naturally sterile nature, urine can often be used to clean a wound when no antiseptic is available. The ability to roll your tongue into a tube is an inherited trait and not everyone can do it. Uh, cavities and poor, poor oral hygiene can lead to diabetes and heart attacks. Uh, some experts believe that daily flossing can add over six years of, to your life because the bacteria growing in your mouth can escape into the bloodstream. It can cause problems in other parts of the body. Uh, someone with poor oral hygiene has a four times greater risk of a stroke and 14 times the greater risk of a heart attack. And the risk for diabetes is also much higher. Uh, current research indicates that stomach cancer affecting 33,000 Americans each year may originate from uh, bone marrow cells that enter the stomach to repair the damage in the stomach lining. So a recent study has showed that individuals who walked uphill cleared fats from their blood faster, while downhill hiking reduced sugars more readily and improved glucose tolerance. And any, any type of hiking removed LDLs, low-density lipoproteins. So this may affect exercise recommendations for various conditions. Okay. A CIPA, C-I-P-A, uh, congenital insensitivity to pain with uh, anhydrosis. It's a rare genetic disorder that affects the development of small nerve fibers with, that transmit the sensation of pain and heat and cold to the brain. So people with this condition don't feel those types of sensations because the nerve 
fibers aren't there to transmit those signals. There are only 84 known cases in the United States. These are patients are at a very high risk of injury, uh, like burns, for example, because they don't know when they're in danger. They don't know that they're touching something very, very hot. They don't feel heat or cold, so they don't sweat. Uh, biting their tongue is a very distinct possibility when they're eating because they don't feel the pain from biting their tongue. All right, we'll end this video and end uh, this video series on anatomy and physiology for uh, medical professionals uh, with some points of interest. Uh, forensic science is the application of science to law. Uh, natural sciences, including anatomy, physiology, and social sciences, are used when uh, solving crimes. Uh, not only is forensic science used in, to solve current mysteries, but it has been used to solve ancient mysteries as well. The uniqueness of fingerprints was written written about as early as the 1600s. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is a form of identifying individuals from only a small amount of body fluid or tissues. The geriatric, uh, geriatric population is the fastest growing population in the United States. Uh, the hallmark sign of aging is the decreased ability to maintain homeostasis or a stable internal environment. Our bodies don't age evenly and some systems age more rapidly than others. The loss of mental uh, capacities is not directly related to aging until the age 75 when it is still minimal unless the, uh, disease is present. Uh, due to changes in the gastrointestinal and renal and hepatic systems, older patients may respond differently to many medications that middle-aged or young patients would. Uh, polypharmacy is the use of many drugs at the same time, as often is the result of seeing many different specialists at the same time, without having one medical professional overseeing your overall care. Uh, the most important personal choice that you will make is a healthy lifestyle. And to maintain a healthy lifestyle, it's important to eat properly, exercise, manage stress, and to avoid bad habits. And lastly, uh, some cancers such as skin and lung cancers are highly preventable. They're limiting the amount of sunlight exposure and the intensity of sunlight exposure and not smoking are two ways, two easy ways that can help prevent cancer. All right, that brings us to the end of this uh, chapter and also to the end of our video series on anatomy and physiology for the medical professional. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you feel that you've learned something. And thank you for watching.